How's it going, everyone? Mr. Prolific here with Context Gaming. I'm here with my longtime fellow Packer Packer, Cody Cottrell, here for our first official Context Gaming podcast. Cody, how's it going? Uh, it's going great, Andrew. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a beautiful day in Packerland. Lots of uh, controversy and uh, intrigue for the upcoming season. Holy cow, uh, we're uh, not going to have any shortcomings for, for discussion topics, I'll tell you that. So I figure we'll just kind of get right into it and uh, maybe we'll break this up into a couple parts and we'll just kind of see how it goes. Uh, how, Cody, what'd you think about the 2019, 2020 Packers season? What'd you think about the first, first season? Uh, got to say totally exceeded my expectations. Um, you know, uh, going into the hire, a lot of people, uh, you know, they had lower expectations saying playoffs were a pipe dream. I wasn't quite that low. You know, I was hoping for maybe a wild card. 13-3 NFC Championship game, uh, that's a hell of a start. Best start in Packers history for first-year coach. For sure. For sure. He exceeded my exp- at my expectations as well. I was hoping for like 8-8, eight and eight, maybe 9-7 and seven at the best. He really seems to have a way with the players of like galvanizes his, 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 his players together. Um, I think his – his offense is still a work in progress. I think we haven't really seen the, the Lafleur, Lafleur system yet, but um, I'm encouraged by what I've seen. Uh, I was a little skeptical being such a young coach and never really having any head coach experience. I'll be I'll be the first to admit I was all on board with wanting Josh McDaniels as the head coach. Uh, that was who I was pulling for, but seems like we potentially have found maybe a diamond in the rough in Lafleur, but. It's a little too early to crown that after one year, so. Yeah, I mean, I actually I think that's a, a great jumping off point for uh, for everything that's going on right now is going back to that hiring decision because I was in the same boat. Um, McDaniel's seemed like a match made in heaven with Rogers, um, and I think everyone was sort of expecting that that we were going through interviews mm. just to get a lay of the land, but we always had our eye on McDaniel's, and then. Out of nowhere, uh, you know, with what, 39-year-old Matt LaFleur or however old he is, yeah. uh, yep. you know, he gets the interview a couple of days later, he's the hire. And I don't think anyone saw that coming, but uh, so far, pretty promising results. Absolutely. 180 from McCarthy system. What do you think about, like, the LaFleur system versus the McCarthy system? I mean, McCarthy seems to be like a 4-5 spread, wants to spread it out. Pass heavy, pass comes first, run comes second. LeFleur is kind of like the complete opposite. Condensed formations, having multiple people in the backfield. He wants to run to set up the play action pass. Does a lot of motion stuff, it looks like. Just, I I think we're going to see a whole new Packer offense here in, in the coming years. So, what what's your thoughts on it? Well, uh, I'm still waiting to see it. You know, the, we got a lot of talk about uh, – how creative of an offensive mind uh, LaFleur is and, you know, how there's going to be new motion sets, uh, scheming players open, um, not relying on guys winning their one-on-one so much. Um, and to be honest, last year I thought uh, I thought the offense wasn't all that different from McCarthy's. Uh, I definitely saw I, – I, I saw the beginnings of the direction they want to go in you know, more, I mean, certainly they utilized Jones more and he paid that off with a breakout season. Um, but within the passing game itself, uh, I didn't see as much motion as I was expecting. Didn't see the receivers getting schemed open. Um, and, you know, it's debatable. It, is that because we didn't have the pieces that LaFleur wants? Or is that because Aaron Rodgers is playing Aaron Rodgers ball? I, I think it was a little bit of a mix mishmash between like, I think he tried like Rogers is so ingrained in the McCarthy system that the only system he's ever known. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think in the second, third year, that's really when we're going to see like if it's working or not. Um, Devante was hurt for a good portion of the year that kind of cut into it, but we won every single game that he was out for. Uh, which also speaks volumes for like Aaron Jones. Uh, he really separated himself. He can he can flourish in Lafleur's system. So like and he, you know, he even then, 
that four game stretch, it's uh, you know, it's not like we were running up with two tight end sets every play and, and running the power game. We were spreading the ball around. Um, you know, that offense was zipping and it, it showed that Rogers he can execute an elite offense without Devontae in there. But uh, for whatever reason, you know, if, if there was one key theme to the 2019 season, uh, consistently inconsistent. You know, it seemed like we never put four quarters together of dominant mm-hmm. football. No, uh, we would show flashes here and there, and then we just never really put it together. But somehow we managed to piece it together and found a way to win. Good football teams find a way to win and managed to have a 13-3 and season out of out of it, um, the uh, the division championship game was encouraging, and then we had to right into that awful NFC championship game where we just got ran over. I was hopeful, you know, but uh, San Francisco. I think the San Francisco system is what Green Bay wants to be in a couple of years down the road, where multiple running backs, run heavy. Uh, The receivers are complementary pieces in the offense. They don't have any, like, breakaway stars at receiver, but they're fast. They can take the top off the defense. Uh, They want to stretch that secondary and then get guys out of the box and then just wear defenses down by rotating those running backs in and out. And and then on defense, just – having those big guys up front, you know, always putting pressure, not having like just that four man front, putting enough pressure on the quarterback where you can drop, drop everyone else into, and into coverage. I mean, that's a luxury to have. Not too many teams got just four defensive linemen that can consistently put pressure on a quarterback. So uh, I think we're a long ways to go from there. Um, I think the NFC championship was telling of that. Um, But hopefully I think, in a few years, our offense wants to be what San Francisco is right now. What, what do you think? Well, yeah, I uh, I agree with you there, Mr. Prolific. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I think that's really the, the crux of the drama right now is that, uh, you know, the first-year coach we hired, we brought him in expecting a multi-year implementation of his system think we got a lot of lucky breaks last year and far outperformed expectations mm-hmm. um so now we're in this situation where you're one game away from the super bowl um and you're playing us a, a certain mix between the new system and the old system you know relying on roger's habits and relying on lafleur's new philosophy And uh, this sort of yin and yang inexplicably took us to the NFC Championship game. And with uh, Mr. Rogers, you know, getting up there long in the tooth, a lot of people are saying, why didn't we get more weapons? Why why are we preparing as if we're three years away when we were one game away last year? And, uh, And for me, this... This goes back to, like I said earlier, the the decision to hire LaFleur, I want to be a fly in the wall in that room. Because Absolutely. If, if, you, if you know that he's going to put in an offensive system that conflicts with the kind of ball your franchise quarterback wants to play, why did they pick him above McDaniels, above anyone else? At, You know, it's – and now we're starting to see some of that friction as, you know, uh, our GM, he went out and he he helped our defensive coordinator last year getting getting the players for the system. But now is the first time we're really seeing him grab those offensive guys for his brand-new head coach. And uh, it's it's got a lot of people scratching their heads, but there's also – I think there's a method to the madness. What what are you seeing here? Man, I – have been more optimistic than the general Packer lands. I feel uh, I'm willing to take a wait and see approach on this. Um, I'm hopeful. I mean, we, at at the end of the day, we don't really have a choice. Uh, We can criticize as much as we want, but this is still going to be our team. 
regardless. So I want every player that we drafted to be successful. Uh, we're not the GM. We can't make these decisions. But I was surprised, to say the least, in all of our selections. I was hoping for a wide receiver, at least. Um, however, I think a lot of this blowback is because we have been so spoiled by what the McCarthy system gave us in terms of passing stats and snap. It goes back to the LaFleur system. I think that everyone's in such an uproar about not getting a receiver because everyone is still ingrained in the McCarthy system themselves where you need to have multiple like standout receivers. Like they think that we need to go back to the, you know, the 2010 Super Bowl season where we have the like Jordy driver, uh, Jennings and uh, James Jones. I don't think the low floor system is that. I think it's exactly what the Tennessee Titans are currently. It's what the 49ers are currently. I don't think he wants to have three or four breakout receivers. I think he wants to have three or four really good running backs. So I, I hear you. I, I, I think uh, what you're going to get a lot of people questioning about that premise, though, is who has earned the organization's trust more? Aaron Rodgers delivering a career of MVP Hall of Fame football or a guy who had one season as an offensive coordinator under his belt with an offense ranked, I think, 27th in the league. Um, and now he wants to come in and sort of conflict with our franchise quarterback style. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's the wrong call. I'm not saying it'll not work out. Um, but it's, uh, it's a major, major gamble by the organization. And, uh, once again, I'd love to be in that room here in those discussions because I think there's more to it than, uh, than us fans are privy to. So it takes me back to a locker room interview with Rogers in the, in the off season last year, where the media kept asking him a bunch of questions about like this personnel decision or that personnel decision. And Rogers put it simply, he goes, I'm not in charge of these decisions. I'm just a player. My job, I get paid to go out there and perform no matter who's around me. And I think that's literally what, Goody Koontz and LaFleur, mostly Goody Koontz, is going with going forward is Rodgers, as great as he as he is, this is a this is a not a what have you done for me business. It's what are you going to do for me going forward? And Rodgers is still great. He can still win you games, but we've it's going on ten years since we've won a Super Bowl and we I don't believe that Rodgers can just win us a Super Bowl by himself anymore. I think he needs to become a complementary piece to something bigger around him, something similar to like uh, Peyton Manning did in Denver where he had the dominant defense. Whoa, 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 PP. I, I got to pump the brakes here right now. Peyton Manning in Denver. All right, yeah, his first year in Denver, prolific, one of the, the greatest ever. The Super Bowl year in Denver – he may as well have been coming out on the field in a <laughs> wheelchair, throwing ducks up and hoping one of his guys caught him. Their defense won that Super Bowl. And I think that there is a misleading narrative about the decline of Aaron Rodgers recently. Uh, yeah, if you look at the stats, completion percentage has gone down, passing yards, touchdowns. Uh, you know, most – metrics that that you look at um you know you would say he's a player in decline but i want to look at the actual performance on the field and the team performance how far are you getting in the playoffs as I'll, I'll make this real quick but let's run back to to the the height of aaron Rodgers to the supposed decline let's go back to 2014 NFC Championship game. Everyone thought we were winning that game. I'm sorry to bring up the most hurtful. Oh, <laughs> you're really talking on the on the heartstrings of Packer fans right here. Uh, I mean, by by all accounts, you know, 
we should have won that game. It, it was uh, it was a <laughs> hell opened its mouth that day and stole victory from us. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we at that point in time we were Super Bowl favorites every every single season. 2015, Jordy Nelson, our clear number one receiver, done for the year. Entire unit loses their speed element, which has never been replaced since adequately. Mm -hmm. So the 2015 season was a bit of a wash because of that. 2016, we get one good receiver back. Jordy is healthy again. NFC Championship game again. 2017, Rodgers is injured. 2018, that is the turning point in my eyes. To me, the 2018 season, it was not about Aaron Rodgers declining. It was about the veterans on the team realizing there wasn't much time left. A-Rod, on the back nine of his career, suffered an injury last year that I think got in his head and made him realize there was only so many more shots at a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just I think a lot of the bets, the message from McCarthy had grown stale. There was too much dysfunction in that organization. Uh, I fully believe Aaron Rodgers played a role in running McCarthy out of town. Um, you know, it's not pretty, but I, I think it had to be done. I believe it's ran. It- it ran its course. They, they, and then, uh, lo and behold, as soon as McCarthy's gone, Aaron Rodgers next season, NFC Championship game. You, you tell me a guy who has taken his team to the NFC Championship game three times in, uh, let's see, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, three times in the last six years, one of those years taken out by injury, another of them taken out by injury to another player. That's a hell of a success rate. Don't tell me about Aaron Rodgers' decline. No, I'm not saying I, – I I agree completely. We've had some pretty bad breaks along the years. Rodgers should, should, should have had more Super Bowls than what he had, or at least more Super Bowl appearances than what he's had. It's the way the NFL, though. Like, I do feel like we have banked on – we've had the luxury of banking on Rodgers a little bit too much, though. Um Yes, we have not done the best job of surrounding him with the best weapons. However, I've been seeing a lot of this hoopla about he's only thrown one touchdown pass to one first-round receivers. I do feel like that is a clear slap in the face to some of these second-round, third-round players that we've managed to dig up who have exceeded expectations and performed way better than a lot of first-round wide receivers have built. The, The round that you're selecting should not be contingent upon like your career uh you take away like look at some of these other receivers that they've thrown to these other quarterbacks with higher stats have thrown to we have had greg jennings jordy nelson and Devontae Adams all selected i think randall cobb might have been selected in the second or third round as well all selected in the second or third round they should have i guarantee any every gm if they had a chance would go back and select them very highly in the first round they are first round talents. So I can't argue that. That's the that is a good point there. Um so I mean I no matter what way you slice it, you know, some people are in the camp that we never supported Rogers enough. Uh frankly I don't think offense was the issue there. I think holding on to Dom Caper is about five years too long was the I issue. agree with that. Uh and if you want to get into it later, I, I would be glad to talk about Mike Petton and uh and frankly, I'm not a huge fan. Um, Absolutely. Uh, part two, we'll be covering a lot about Mike Patton and the Patton defense and Capers versus Patton. Uh, there, that, that could be a whole show in and of itself for sure. Yeah. Um, as well as our draft woes on the defensive end uh, over the last couple decades, I would say. We've had a lot of whiffs in the first and second round. We've taken a lot of defensive talent early who have not panned out as well as they should have. For sure. So I, and then we've let go a lot of good players as well. Uh, we've also had talent in our in our building that we underutilize, misutilize, and, and they flourished elsewhere. Uh, Casey Hayward and Micah Hyde come come out right on top of my head. But that we'll save that for another show. Um, I will move on, but I do want to ask you this question. 
Do you think we have seen the best game from Aaron Rodgers? Or will he have a better game going forward? Have we already seen the best actual game from Aaron Rodgers sometime previously? Or now you're saying in one individual performance. That's that's yep. what you're saying. Have we seen the best that he has in him on the field? And I don't know how you get much better than the Super Bowl season against the Atlanta Falcons in uh, in what was divisional rounds. I mean, that's that was masterful. Um, but, I mean, the thing is, the guy, he authors performances like that, just jaw-dropping, how did he do that kind of performances every year. A year doesn't go by where he – isn't making top 10 plays of the year. Um, now, having said that, yeah, the guy has suffered some injuries. I think it's, uh, it has affected his, his accuracy a little bit. Um, maybe more time to build up strength in the arm, recover more. Maybe that will return, maybe not. Uh, obviously, Father Time's catching up with his legs, not quite as fast as he used to be. Um, but just because he is not doing, you know, athletically unbelievable things anymore, I don't think that means we've seen the best of him. I mean, John Elway, he was on his last legs when he made one of the most iconic plays in NFL history, that helicopter dive over the goal line. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, – I. I think Aaron Rodgers still has big moments left in him. And uh, I, I hope to see some of them in person before he uh, hangs up the cleats. I think so as well. Uh, I think we have seen, I think we have seen his best statistical game already. Um, I will have to go back and look at States to pinpoint the exact game. Uh, however, with that being said, I do think that, he is far from washed up. I think that we are going to see multiple huge games from him over the next few seasons. Um, do you feel like, do, do you think that his collarbone injury has, is still affecting him to this day? Or do you think he's fully recovered from that? Do you think he's got as much zip on the ball? Or do you think you, you mentioned accuracy earlier? Do you think, do you think the, the damage is done there? Like, He's still a very accurate quarterback. He can throw dimes in the windows, but well, so that's that's the interesting question there because uh, you know there were many moments last season, and even uh, you know you said that you think we might have seen his best statistical performance. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we just go back to last year when he's supposedly in decline, the Raiders game uh, would he throw four or five touchdowns in the first half? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, he's he's mm -hmm. still got it, and and when he's on, he's on like nobody else in the league. You know, maybe Patrick Mahomes would be the only guy I'd, I'd put in that same. You know, when they're on fire, I would agree. Child, I would agree. Game. Um, but having said that, you know, long stretches of uh, of inaccurate throws, overthrows, underthrows, mistimed throws, and uh, I think maybe some of that can be attributed to the injury. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't have a huge medical background, so I, you know, I don't claim to be an expert there, but I imagine there was some loss in strength. Um, you know, maybe some of the muscles that uh, aren't related to just sheer velocity of the ball, but, you know, mm -hmm. the, the pinpoint placement. Um, but honestly, I think the bigger issue is mechanics. Uh, you know, Rogers, he can get sloppy sometimes. He still plays he's like he's like he's got the you know godlike powers he did in 2014. Uh, do, you think, do you think that's going to be the death of him though? Do you think he will adapt to? Do you think he can evolve his game, or is he going to be too proud to admit that some of his abilities have diminished? diminished over the years and he will be his own worst enemy going forward. I, I think there's no mistaking that Aaron Rodgers is a very proud man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, uh, he's got a bit of an ego, um, which, mm -hmm. you know, that's not always a bad thing in a quarterback. Um, I mean, I, I think this is, uh, this is really the discussion that I want to dig into is what do we see for Rodgers going forward? 
with clearly the change in offensive philosophy is coming. You know, we've talked about the past. We've talked about Mm -hmm. why did they choose LaFleur over Mm -hmm. other candidates that seemed more obvious at the time. Uh, You know, we can't answer those things for sure. What we do know for sure is LaFleur is the guy. The change is coming. This draft and this free agency period are all the proof we need of that. Mm -hmm. So what do we see Aaron Rodgers playing like over the next two, three years in that system? Are we going to be the Tennessee Titans where they all of a sudden turn Ryan Tannehill into a potential MVP candidate off of play action? Um, Or is it going to be Rodgers calling audibles at the line playing sandlot ball, it's tough to say. And, and frankly, I think a really, you know, once again, I, I wish I could have been there with, with Gutekunst to, to hear this, but Aaron Rodgers' football mind, one of the greatest ever, you know, up there with Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning's offensive coordinators in the, the later years of the Colts, they didn't make any secret about the fact that Peyton – was the offensive coordinator. He was calling the plays at the line. He ran everything because he saw things that coordinators mm-hmm. didn't. Why did we decide Aaron Rodgers wasn't capable of that responsibility? Why did we decide to take a guy who's going to rein him in rather than open him up? Man, now that you phrase it like that, that is, that is, that is a great question. Um, you know what? I would I would love to have heard – the sales pitch that LaFleur gave Gutekunst and Murphy in that interview. Uh, yeah, like that guy could sell a, a broken car and a, and a used pair of underwear. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's got salesmanship. However, I, while I do think that we are going to be more run oriented than we ever have before. If you look back at, the Matt Ryan years in Atlanta when both Kyle Shannon and Matt LaFleur was on that system, Ryan flourished and they also had a pretty good running game. Now, granted they did have Julio Jones, but we do have Devontae Adams. Um, I still see, I still think Rogers is going to get his um, going forward. He's still going to be, you know, pro bowl type player despite being a run oriented offense, I just, I I think it is going to change, especially the formations. I think the people around him, the philosophy around him is just going to change. He's going to, I think what grips me is, and I think we've talked about before candidly is he doesn't hit his check downs. Uh, The running backs in the flats, the tight ends in the flats. He's always looking, trying to buy time for, for the bigger play. And as he gets older, that's not going to be that he needs to hit his checkdowns more. I think the checkdowns are going to be abundant in Lafleur's system. Uh, I think Aaron Jones can eat. He can he can eat in this offense uh, if Rodgers hits him. I, I I see almost like a Amon Green in his prime years in Green Bay. That's what Aaron Jones can be. And I do think that our new running back AJ Dillon can be like an Eddie Lacy. And a lot of people are bashing on because of the uh, pass catching chops. However, everything I've read and heard is that he can catch. He he is he is he is a pass catcher. But the Boston College offensive system is not a system that is very pass heavy for 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 running backs. And we've seen that for lots of college athletes coming out of college and then going to the pros is all of a sudden they they blow up. But that's just because of the system they were in wasn't conducive to their to their abilities now AJ Dillon's a big back uh I don't think we're going to be seeing like like a Todd Gurley catching like 80 90 passes we're not going to see Christian McCaffrey out there with AJ Dillon I do think that uh when we need him to he can catch I'm I'm seeing realistic around like maybe like like between 20 and 30 passes this year but that's almost in a timeshare with Aaron Jones who's also going to be getting you know maybe 40 50 catches this year too so combined our running backs are going to get you know 80 to 90 catches perhaps that is wide receiver two numbers because Devontae Adams will sniff close to running catches as well so I think everything's being overblown about not having a prolific wide receiver two 
I think our wide receiver two will be our running backs. That because the Lafleur system, everything's condensed. You don't see the running backs, you know, lying out wide. So I do think our wide receiver two will be a combination of our running backs, and then we we will need a third wide receiver to step up. Um, I am I am hopeful that MVS will make huge strides this year. Uh, third year, usually wide receivers take take that third year, and then they usually bust out. That's their make or break season. We, um, if you do compare Devontae Adams' stats to MBS's stats, they're very similar. Um, and a, 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 apart from catches, Devontae does have about 20 or 30 more catches in, in that first couple years span, but yardage-wise and touchdown-wise, they are very similar. Um, I, I do hope that we that and he, and we do need him to make those strides because we cannot bank on Devin Funchess as as well. So, um, and God help us if like Jake Kumaro is our, uh, <laughs> is our wide receiver too. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this, PP. Yep. What do you see as the X's and O's? What, what do you see our, our primary formations being this year? What, what kind of bread and butter plays? Uh, and, and before I let you answer that, I, I do just want to say, you talking about AJ Dillon catching passes? Uh, you know, I, I haven't put much thought into it before, but man, I would not want to be a linebacker Mm-mm. trying to take him down on a screen mm-hmm. pass. That uh, I think you put him, you do screens with him, you put Jones in the slot or out wide. Uh, I do think there is a a lot of variety and creativity you could get um, in a two back formation, two Absolutely. tight end formation. Uh, but but tell me, what do, what do you think, Matt Lafleur? Uh, now that he he's been, you know, given the tools mm-hmm. that, that he needs to operate his offense, what do you think we're going to see in the twenty twenty season? Uh, mixed packages. A uh, lot of confusion. I think we're going to see a lot more uh, movement before the play, before the play play at, at the line line of scrimmage. Um, we might even do. Two tight end sets, uh, two running back sets. You might see a lot of Aaron Jones on the field as well as A.J. Dillon and Jamal Williams as well sprinkled in. Uh, two tight end sets, uh, big dog Mercedes Lewis as well as Jay Sternberger. Um, might even do some three in the backfield as well with like two tight end sets as well. I don't think we're going to do a lot of spread. I don't see I don't see the four or five wide, wide receivers very often unless we're late in the game and we're down big. Um, but I, if you look at the way they're drafting now, is you're getting the Aaron Joneses who can, you know, motion out and play receiver. You're getting the um, our new tight end, uh, um, Degura. Degura. Yeah. He he's he's going to replace Danny Vitale and Jimmy Graham. Ideally, in a perfect world, he's going to be both combination both he's gonna be a lead blocker and then when we need him to he's got the ability to to move out and then become a receiver if we want to come in chip in get or say like like a Jadavian clown he's killing us on the end like rick wagner our new right tackle is having a hard time he's he's gonna be the, be the guy that chips uh in on that uh, you're going to see a lot of just motions before the lines, like confusing, trying to confuse the defenses as much as possible. And then as when we do go into uh, a no huddle, we got the personality that can play multiple different positions that, that they can line up somewhere else and we don't got to make subs. I think that's what we're transitioning into. Um, whether or not it comes to fruition is anyone's guess right now. But that's ideally what I I feel like we're going to see. Um, now, it's just going to be different, man. It's just going to be way different because I am used to, like, when you're playing Madden, I love the four wide receiver sets. I love the five wide receiver sets and just running like like Tripp's gun, you know, just, just sending them deep, having, having those wide receivers out there. I just think we can do the Tripp's gun now. It's just not going to be five wide receivers. It's going to be we're going to have, like, Devontae and another receiver, and we're going to have, like, two tight ends and a running back out there doing that type thing. So, I don't know. It's just what I see going forward. I think that's a little first, the Matt Wiffler system. So Yeah. And I, I do hope that, uh, you know, now with these additional tools, I mean, I got to say, I 
I'll be the first to admit, I wasn't jazzed about drafting an H back in the third round. Mm -mm. But thinking about the possibilities of, uh, you know, how LaFleur wants to run his offense and, you know, that these players were hand selected. Uh, you know, I even read something recently that last year before the draft, you know, in the middle of the season, they LaFleur used some footage of Josiah DeGora in a college game as a teaching moment for the team. Oh, wow. So they, they've had their eye on this guy for a while. For a so while. It, each back or not, um, I mean, clearly they see him being a vital part of this offense. So I, I look at it like, you know, maybe now in year two with these extra pieces, maybe this is where we start to see all the motion that we, mm -hmm. we heard about and being multiple. I mean, you, so you put, uh, you know, you got Degura and Jay Sternberger, two tight end set with A.J. Dillon playing fullback, Jones tailback, and then Devontae out wide. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you shift Jones into the slot, put Dylan as your running back, move Degura to fullback. I mean, these defenses aren't going to know what hit them. And, and you know, that's – I I do think a lot of fans had their hearts set on wide receiver, historically deep draft. We're so used to seeing Rodgers work with prolific receivers. Um, but I do think there's still – we're not going to be the worst offense in the league. No, um, I, I think there's Far a lot to be excited about. Uh, mm -hmm. That the only thing that remains a concern to me after draft in the free free agency period is uh, I do think we're still missing a speed element on offense. Uh, you know, MBS obviously fast guy. Yeah, but, uh, he's kind of a straight line runner. Um, he's I don't see he doesn't have a very developed root tree, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if just running a guy deep every time really makes defense respect speed in the same way that mm -hmm. uh that a guy who's maybe slightly slower but runs better routes would um so i this thought did just pop in my head i'm going a little bit off off script on this so i do think that the whole not taking a receiver in this draft is being a little bit blown out of proportion a little bit I'm trying to think back. I don't remember what year it was. I'm trying to think back to the Matt Ryan's MVP year when Lafleur and Kyle Shan were both on that on that offense. Who were Matt Ryan's receivers on that team? Julio, <laughs> Julio. So Julio, Julio, Devontae Adams. Other than that, he had a prolific offensive season, MVP season. I, who else did he have? Who was his wide receiver too? It doesn't that's, immediately that's jump to me. That's a good point. You know, I want to say maybe Muhammad Sanu, but I, I can't say that for sure. It doesn't jump to my head. Uh, I know he had a great tight end as, as well. Um, was Tony Gonzalez playing for him that year? He, he could have been because um, it was before the Austin Hooper yeah. breakout. Um, but even with that said, like Matt Ryan had an MVP season with only Julio Jones coming to the top of my mind right now. I'm – like in my head, Rod, like that could, that can be what Rogers becomes. Like we can still be a prolific offense with just one legit elite wide receiver one, and then just make do with our other receivers. If you have enough, if you have a system that utilizes every player's talents and confuses defenses. Like, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, now that I think about it, uh, Taylor Gabriel, he was their slot guy that year. It was the best season he ever had. Uh, I mean, frankly, he looks so good in Atlanta. I was uh, worried when Chicago signed him. <laughs> Absolutely. Chicago just bared it up. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, if if we envision – I think there's a lot more in the playbook for Aaron Jones than we've seen so far. And, and if we so envision too. him being a Taylor Gabriel-type player when we want him to be, but also be – a lead league and lead or league leading running back when we want him to be, uh, you know, once again, it goes back to being multiple. Um, I, you know, yeah, I, I think we've got some elite weapons on this offense. Uh, to me, honestly, the most interesting player, um, you know, other than right tackle uh, Bobby Wagner or Rick, Rick Wagner, Rick Wagner. Yep. Rick Wagner. Don't even know the bum's name. <laughs> I, I, I don't even want to get into the big uglies. I, uh, oh. you know, I, I have a love for offensive linemen. Uh, but if we, if we put that aside, um, 
Jay Sternberger. I th I think uh, his performance this year. I think we're putting a lot on his shoulders, and he are. could either break out, or uh, or if he doesn't, that that might be the thing that slows our offense down. I also think that plays into us taking a tight end in the third round. I don't think that Gutekunst just wants to hand over that top tight end slot to a tight end who is unproven. You know, he, he is going into year three, I believe. Going in, in year, year two. Three. Year two. Year two. So usually it does take, you know, a tight end a couple seasons to actually get acclimated and then bust out. I don't think that, like, it's almost like an insurance. We, that's why we re sign. Marseille's Lewis as well. Like, uh, he's reliable. He's a veteran. We can plug him in when we need to in a big moment if Jace or Degora is not ready to go. But I do think that also that played into Gutekunst's thinking and taking taking the tight ends. He doesn't just want to hand over the reins of our of our tight end one spot to a second year tight end. As talented as he may be, it I don't know. It's like that tight end position is very finicky you know like yeah i i don't necessarily see degura as a tight end though i mean obviously he played tight end in college that's what he's lifted as but the guy is six two on on a good day uh you know i i really do see him filling an h-back role that i think yeah. we are probably gonna utilize h-back more than any other team in the league uh, I, I think, think so. i think it's gonna be you know, maybe maybe LaFleur is trying to be forward thinking in, in a Bill Belichick way here where, you know, what aren't the other teams doing? And, you know, everyone's going smaller, trying to defend receivers. Let's get some big guys out there. Uh, you know, so it, I, I do think he'll get snaps at tight end for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I still think that uh, I think that there's a lot on Sternberger's uh, shoulders this year. The reason I am a little bit more hopeful about and the reason why I think DeGora is going to like almost do a 50 50 split between H back and tight end is the fact that we did have Danny Vitale and all that guy did was make plays in the preseason and in training camp. He stood out as an H back. He was a good H back and come regular season. LaFleur refused to like utilize him and utilize his talents. And I think that's because, he's just a stereotypical H back and he can't bust out and do tight end stuff or do receiver stuff or do blocking stuff. Other than if it's coming out like an eye formation, I think that hindered him. And I think that's why he was so attracted to someone like Tagora because he can do both. And I know multiple reporters over the season asked LaFleur over and over again, why are you not, why are you praising Danny Vitale so much, but yet come game day, you're not utilizing him. And, you know, LaFleur's going to give a PR response, but I think it's because that he's kind of a one dimensional player in his eyes. And DeGore is going to give him something that like a chess piece, he can move all around the football field, you know? And I think we're going to see a lot more like almost like a Kyle, Kyle Juszczyk. He is, whether he's a poor man's Kyle, Kyle Juszczyk or a better version of Kyle Juszczyk is to be seen, but that's ideally like what we're trying to aim for with him. Now, whether that's worth a third round draft pick, I don't know. Would you draft Kyle, Kyle Juszczyk in the third round? I've seen some Twitter handles coming out saying like, like as great as Kyle Juszczyk is, do you burn a third round draft pick on Kyle, Kyle Juszczyk? Even a great fullback like him, I don't know if you burn a third round pick on him, but I think the fact that we didn't have a fourth round pick played a lot into us taking him in the third round. Now it's a lot easier to swallow when you take a tight end like that in the fourth round, but we didn't have a fourth round and we traded it to get Jordan Love, which we're going to get to in just a bit. But I think we were so in love with this guy and what he could do multidimensionally that, that we had to take him in the third because he wasn't lasting to the fifth and they didn't, Maybe he does last to the fifth, but they weren't willing to take that chance because that's a player that they identified as a piece that they need to fit their system. He is going to be a stereotypical LaFleur system piece. If you put him on any other team, he's not going to flourish, but I think that you're going to see him use his best abilities. I'm, I'm hopeful that he does because otherwise I'm going to be scratching my head and wondering why he took a tight end that was projected on the sixth round and third round. 
he's got to do something differently than from a tight end standpoint that attracted them. He, he's got to do more than tight end, stereotypical tight end stuff. And that's just why I think we probably took him. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, he, you know, like I said, like they, they've been following him for a while. They, uh, they liked him. They went and got the guy, uh, you know, can't, can't blame him for doing that. Um, I do think that we can question the value. Well, why? Yeah, we didn't have a fourth round pick. Why didn't Goot trade back? Uh, I mean, for that matter, why didn't he trade back when we took AJ Dillon in the second? You know, a lot of people projected him as a third or fourth round guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think we realistically could have recouped that fourth round pick that we used to move up for love. Um, and and to me, you know, a lot. A lot of people are up in arms about this draft. Let's let's dive into it right now. We'll we'll Might get into well, the draft because yeah. that's that's the yeah. juicy thing that everyone's talking about right now. Um, you know, a lot of people they see this Jordan Love pick as a slap in the face to Rodgers. You know, they they say that Aaron Rodgers was a potential number one overall pick who just happened to slide to us, and the value was too good to pass up. Mm-hmm. Jordan Love, on the other hand borderline first round pick that uh you know the Colts were probably the only realistic competition for him at the time and we trade up to get him um when Rodgers just signed a contract extension uh four more years and he says he wants to play for you know another seven eight years I can see why a lot of people question it but me personally don't have a problem to pick I mean, the guy, he's got the tools. He's, he had a bad year last year, but he had a great year the year before. Lost, um, his, lost everyone around him. He lost all of his, like, offensive weapons around him, and he was going through a whole new coaching as well. Yeah. I mean I, – I heard, I heard that he lost four offensive linemen and every skill position player. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's I, – I think it's going to serve him really well to sit and learn behind a rod mm-hmm. um, you know, if, if it's me, I want him sitting for three years. I, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, I would too. That would be ideal for me. Uh, I mean, you're losing some value on the rookie contracts, but I, I do think he's a project it, and it's a project that could pay huge deb- dividends. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say the guy could be a hall of famer. We, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, that, that's the swing that, that the organization has taken there. You know, they're saying mm-hmm. maybe it's a year too early or even two years too early. But if we think this is the guy and we expect to always be picking near the bottom of round one, mm-hmm. who cares if it takes a first and a fourth? Uh, if, if that gives you 10 more years of, uh, of top tier quarterback play, you, you do that Absolutely. 100% of the time. Absolutely. Um, My issue is with the rest of the draft, but uh, I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> My my overall opinions of the Jordan Love pick in a condensed fashion is I can see why they did it. Um, if you read all the scouting reports and watch the game tape, he, he passes the eye test for me in, in game, take, um, game tape. The intangibles, he has every intangible that you look for in an elite quarterback the things that he struggles with are things that I feel like are coachable and every draft punnet universally has acknowledged that he's physically the most gifted quarterback in this draft more than Joe Burrow, who went first overall Joe Burrow, by the way, was a borderline back end first round pick a year ago today. Got I beat up by Dwayne Haskins. Yeah. At Ohio State. Everyone said tank for Tua, tank for Tua, tank for Tua. And he was the consensus number one pick. He didn't even go number one. So that's how much this like things change in, in, in the NFL. But the one thing that didn't change is that Jordan Love has the physical tools to be an elite quarterback in the NFL. He just he's just raw. He makes dumb decisions at times. He's erratic at times. And he's hot and cold. He's like a stereotypical hot and cold. He'll make an amazing play, but then come back with a bonehead play the next time. Those things can be coached, and if you identify a guy that could be a number one pick if he didn't suffer those like those raw trait things, 
why would you not take him in the end of the first round? Even if you had, you know, like a Tom Brady in his prime or an Aaron Rodgers, like even like even like six, seven years ago, if you if you had Aaron Rodgers at like 30 years old on your team and you knew that you can get another Aaron Rodgers on your team at the age of like 23, even though you knew you had still 10 more years of Aaron Rodgers left in the first round, why still, why would you not take that? Given if you look at the, the, the whole, especially the back end of the first round, and you look at how many first round picks actually pan out. It's like less than 50%. It's probably less than like 30, 25%. Like it's hard to find like, elite talent the back end of the first round they get gobbled up early so if like you can always you can always trade them now i don't think you take a quarterback like jordan love and you trade him especially with the age that rogers is at now but if you had like a 30 year old rogers and you draft him yeah flip him for like a super early like first round pick like maybe a top 10 pick who knows now i do think that we took jordan love we were talking about wide receivers in that draft. I do fully believe that we want a receiver, but there was a run on right wide receivers in that draft. A lot of people said that, like, wait to the second round because you're going to have a lot of good receivers in the second round. Well, I also think that, like, a lot of people thought that teams were going to pass on wide receivers in the first round because they can get that guy in the second round. I don't think that happened. I think that Green Bay identified maybe two or three receivers that they thought were elite talents, maybe like a C.D. Lamb. Or uh, maybe they thought Jerry Judy was elite as well. Uh, I think they had their eye on Justin Jefferson, maybe. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that the receivers that they thought could help. Now, again, if you look at like an MVS or even Devontae, Devontae was a second round draft pick. Devontae didn't actually contribute anything meaningful until his third year in the NFL. So everyone's complaining that we didn't get Rodgers a first round receiver. When, when someone like Devontae, as good as he is now, wasn't able to adapt to the NFL into his third year, that doesn't do Aaron Rodgers any good taking the receiver in the first round if you if he's not going to help you till the, till year three. You might as well take a Jordan Love in the first round because by the time Rodgers' contract runs out, you could potentially have another Aaron Rodgers in the in the wings. Meanwhile you finally get that first round receiver that you took in 2020 who finally pans out in 2022 Rogers is a year away from his contract being over. Like, does it really help you that much? If you're going to reach for almost not reach, but you know, take a developmental receiver, would you rather have a developmental receiver in the first or developmental quarterback who could become Aaron Rodgers or Pat Mahomes when Rogers is like 40 years old? Now, if that's your thinking, I'd rather have Jordan Love at that point and, and not have to worry about quarterback again until like the year, you know, 2036 or 2037. We, let's, let's, let's have 45 years of elite quarterback play. <laughs> now, now, that's a lot to put on Jordan Love's plate because we're trying to catch lightning in a bottle a second time, which is almost impo- – no team's ever done that before. Now, does, does Jordan Love become a Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers? I think he's got more Brett Favre in him than Aaron Rodgers, but – I see the upside, and I see why they did it. Now, now you say, like, oh, a lot of people's issues is, like, oh, we trade up to get him. But if there was no one else on – if he was the last guy on your board that you had a first-round grade on and you're still, like, six or seven picks away and it's a quarterback and you know teams are quarterback hungry in this league, if he's your last guy on your board that's got a first-round grade on, I don't care that you trade up to get him. If that's the last guy on your board that you felt could be a game changer at some point in his career, go get it, man. Yeah. No, I uh, like, like I said, I I'm I was surprised by the pick, but uh, I I'm on board with it. I agree with it. Mm-hmm. But I do I want to play devil's advocate for a minute, just just to look at you know two sides. The, uh, the alternate universe where. Uh, where we make a different decision. We are playing um, with fire with this. We are playing with fire because there's <laughs> something will happen, man. You know, whether it's two years, three years, or four years, at some point Green Bay has put themselves into a corner and they have to make a decision. Do you ex- Even if Rodgers plays out of his mind in four years and has like four straight MVPs, say he has four straight MVPs and he wins you four Super Bowls, at that point, you got you can extend love for one more year and take and take the extension. 
do you extend Rodgers and go with him at 40 years old, despite winning four MVPs and four Super Bowls for you? Or do you finally say, like, let's give the 24, 25-year-old Jordan Love, who's sat behind our five-time, six-time MVP quarterback, a run and see what happens. Like, at some point, Green, no matter how good Rodgers plays, we put ourselves in a corner where we have to make a decision. And at that point, it might not be pretty, but – you do have to think about what's best for the organization going forward. So I, I hear you there. I hear you there, but hear, hear me out here. So Jordan Love, you talk about how his, his flaws and weaknesses right now are coachable things. From my understanding, everything that I, I've read and heard, um, his major issue seems to be decision-making uh, and and I mean, frankly, you can you can talk about this both on and off the field. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, after the season, he knew that he was entering the draft as a potential first round pick. Got uh, busted for marijuana possession. Um, do you do you want your franchise player uh, making decisions like that? When I mean, come on, you can't hold out a few months for the biggest paycheck of your life. Uh, I I think there's a difference between decision making and with Aaron Rodgers. Um, you know, a lot of people agreed that when he came into the league, he needed some work. Uh, Obviously, sitting did him a a world of good. But the primary issue with Rodgers was he he had an unusual uh, delivery mechanism. He he held the ball up high, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. And he he didn't get all the velocity that he could on the ball. He actually – he completely reworked his mechanics in those three years behind Favre. Um, which, I mean, when you're talking about throwing motion, that is the epitome of a coachable thing. I mean, you are, you're you practicing those reps every single day, uh, again and again and again. Uh, that is a very changeable thing. Decision-making, yes, I do think it's coachable to a degree, uh, and I certainly think sitting behind a guy like Rodgers, who will probably retire with the highest passer rating in history, I mean, that guy just does not throw picks. Uh, I think that's just about the best situation Jordan Love could have gotten in. Um, But ultimately, I mean, when the lights go on and, uh, you know, guys are playing full speed, you're either a good decision maker or you're not. And, and I hope I, you know, Jordan Love's 2018 season, I think that shows he has the potential, Uh, but his 2019 season shows that, you know, maybe it's hard to say once you get NFL speed, um, you know, we won't know until he, the bullets are flying. But I'm I'm going to move past that because, like I said, I agree with the pick. I think the only other guy who you could realistically say was worth a pick there, uh, maybe Patrick Queen. Um, and, I mean, certainly that would have helped our run defense, uh, which is probably the biggest issue on the team. But when you're looking at the potential of, uh, you know, even if you limit it to only five years – which one of those two players is going to potentially have a bigger impact on your franchise within five years. I don't care if Jordan Love only starts one year, you know, Aaron Rodgers could play Mm -hmm. out his entire contract. Jordan Love takes over Mm -hmm. a franchise potential franchise quarterback is going to trump an inside linebacker every day of the week. For sure. Yeah. What I take more issue with is in the rest of the draft. All right. Love, you had to get your guy, you're being forward thinking. But you were in the NFC Championship game. Knocking on the door of the Super Bowl. You have one of – you've been blessed with something that only one other franchise in the entire 100-year history of the NFL had, and that's two Hall of Fame quarterbacks in a row. you got – several more years with your Hall of Fame quarterback. And they took every one of their picks, every one of their picks after Jordan Love are depth pieces. None of those guys are starters. Not yet. They didn't take, they didn't take anyone to beef up that defensive line. They didn't take any serious inside linebackers. Uh, They didn't try to get a ball hawking corner. Like, there were a lot of directions they could have gone. And I, w- I want to go back to the fact that, like I said, A.J. Dillon, we took him at least around earlier than a lot of people predicted. 
uh, Tagura, potentially three rounds earlier than some people projected. Why weren't we trying to trade back, get some picks, and beef up that defense to help Aaron Rodgers and the vets right now? Because I can tell you, I, will, Andrew, I, I can tell you, the veterans on that team, they're going to be professionals. They're they're going to toe the company line, but they are not happy with the way this draft went. All you got to do is look at the way that David Bakhtiari has been talking lately, poking fun at Jordan Love, telling him where to find the the, uh, the seat warmers on the bench because uh, David Bakhtiari knows that if he's getting another Super Bowl, it's with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, so I, I definitely think the veterans on this team. Oh, yeah. um, the the they, vets are tied to Rodgers for sure because they know that's yeah. their only way. So I will play devil's advocate on this one a little bit. And I will come in with this. So in rounds two or three, which are the impact rounds where you can, you know, get some meaningful talent. Where do you go? What do you draft if you're trying to help Aaron Rodgers right now? Because the way I see it is they did kind of help Aaron Rodgers now. So they're saying, okay, I see you taking a quarterback early in round one because you happen to have like a franchise quarterback who potentially fell to you. Like we get that, but then you should, you, you need wide receiver help. So you should take a wide receiver in round two. Well, take a look at any good wide receiver, like elite Vontae, Jordy, uh, Cobb or Jennings. Jennings did kind of contribute a little bit in his first year. I will give him that. But for the most part, you're not getting anyone who can help Aaron Rodgers get you over, get you past the, the 49ers in the NFC Championship in, in the next year, this year. You're not hey, getting man, anyone. We don't have to go any further than the 49ers. Debo Samuel, yeah, he wasn't a pro bowler for him in his rookie year, but he played a pivotal role in the playoffs. Exactly. And I think more and more rookie wide receivers are contributing. Uh, the, you know, the three-year rule, I don't think that necessarily applies anymore. What, what position in the NFL – gives you the biggest immediate return in year one because I would argue running back. You can take a running back on almost any round and they can give you something in year one. So if that's if your running back is starting, we drafted a guy who I hope he's the second stringer. I, I certainly hope he has the talent to beat out Jamal Williams, but we what, don't even know that. He's not beating Aaron Jones, I can tell you that much. What what position has the biggest turnover rate in the NFL? Why is it Aaron Jones does not have the biggest, like the, the healthiest bill of health in the NFL. So what's a big reason why you got the 13 and three to the Amps championship, Aaron Jones. Is exactly. Williams going to get you 13 and three into the to 49ers. Fifth Probably. round, fifth rounder, Aaron Jones. My point being, Goot did not execute this draft with value in mind. He executed it with the idea of, hey, coach, we hired you. We didn't give you all the, the tools he needed in year one. I guarantee you we're getting them in year two. And I think they sacrificed some value because of that. I think A.J. Dillon, I, I'm excited about him as a player. I, I think he'll be a good part of the team. I think we could have gotten him later. Uh, I, it wouldn't have broken my heart if we didn't get him, if we had to settle for a fourth or fifth round running back. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at guys who are on the board and, you know, we, we could have gotten an impact defensive line player in round two, um, round three, there were still impacts inside linebackers on the board. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about win now, um, I mean, I, I can buy into the idea of we don't need a wide receiver because LaFour's offense isn't going to rely on wide receiver two that much, uh, whether Aaron Rodgers buys into that or not, that's a different story. Uh, but I don't think anyone debates our defense. Uh, we got embarrassed in the NFC Championship game, um, and we have two years in a row of uh, ranking like in the bottom third of the league uh, yardage wise. Um, I mean, do you think that we got? Do you think the NFC Championship game was a result of a lack of talent? or a lack of adjustments to be made in game to combat what they were doing against us. Do you think we had the talent to stop the run? I don't think that defensive line had the talent. Uh, Kenny Clark is the only player on there. Uh, 
cutting Mike Daniels to give Dean Lowry an extension. I think that was a mistake. Uh, you know, obviously Daniels, not the player he used to be. He did get hurt last year. Uh, but the extension for Lowry, that hasn't panned out. And, so and draft picks, uh, you know, Adams and uh, Kingsley, they haven't shown anything yet. You know, just, just the same that Oren Burks, inside linebacker, hasn't shown anything. Uh, you, you know, the fact is this defense is undermanned. And if we're going to the Super Bowl, we have to get past teams like the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, I would love to. Hear, I would love to hear you argue. I would love to hear you argue how AJ Dillon and Josiah Degura get us past the Niners. Uh, well, I think getting past the Niners is going to be a tall, tall drink of water. No matter who you take, even if we went seven straight defensive linemen in this draft, you know, I I, I think it's <laughs> going to be tough to get past this 49ers team. They, I mean, hell, I would I would be happy with just being competitive. We got our socks blown off two times. I, I think the 49ers are just, you know, they have a year or two extra in the, in this, uh, in this um, Shanahan offense, not, not Kyle, like, like the, the Shanahan offense is rooted in his dad's offensive system and they both fall on, under the umbrella. I just think that the 49ers just have more pieces that fit that system than we do right now. I do admit that it's a head scratcher not taking defensive line at all in this draft, other than to the very last round when you took Jonathan Garvin, who pops on tape. He pops on tape, and he potentially could make this 53-man roster, especially at a position of need like that. We did just sign Trayvon Hester, who did make some waves by the way, which is good. I'm glad that we at least are recognizing that we might need to fill that spot a little bit. But it is a little bit of a head scratcher that you don't take any big guys when it appears on paper that that's one of your biggest weaknesses on defense. I the one thing I'm I am concerned of is I do I'm starting to think that Gutekunst maybe puts too much faith in the development of his own drafted players. And that could be a result of being being too proud, being too like like believing in yourself a little bit too much. So and and you see it because he he will overload a position and then he will like neglect it and just wait for them to pan out. Receivers when he took like three straight receivers a few years ago, or then he takes like um, you know he just doesn't seem to like he just thinks that at some point they're gonna pan out. Whether they do or not, I don't know. We do have a young defensive line who is coming into years, you know, like two or three. We are really hitching our ponies to the fact that they have to develop, otherwise we're screwed type thing. Like, they got to develop. Like, Kingsley Keekley, he's got to develop. Montrevious Adams, he's got to be better. Lancaster, he's got to be better. Kenny Clark, he's got. He's even got to be, be better than the elite defensive tackle he already is. Like, Cause, because there's no one else coming in to compete for your job. Because, like, it's on you guys if, like, we're going to ride and die by you. And you guys are young. You're 23, 24, 25 years old. You've, got, you've had three years now in the NFL. If you can't ball out in your third year in the NFL, then you're, you're not getting a contract extension. I think that's kind of, like, the way he's going with this. Is, and that's why he never – he didn't replenish the cupboard with this. So – I don't know. A lot of it, I think this draft seems like a contingency plan for players who are going to be leaving, potentially leaving us if we can't resign them. If you look at it, that's how it falls. Like Jordan Love, all right, you take him just for the case that you might have a franchise quarterback when Rodgers goes. A.J. Dillon, if you can't resign Aaron Jones, then you potentially got a guy in year two with a three more years left on his contract who could be productive for you. Uh, Joseph or Josiah Degora, he's just kind of like a complimentary piece to the Fleur system. And then you got Kamal Martin. He's a clear replacement for um, Blake Martinez if Christian Kirksey doesn't doesn't pan out or gets hurt. And then we went three straight offensive linemen in the sixth round with John Runyon, Jake Hansen, and Simon Stepaniak. It's clear we need to find a future right tackle. Uh Bakhtiar and Lindsley are up. There's a chance that we probably only got enough money to resign one of them. Uh, I would assume that's going to be Bakhtiar because left tackles are a premium, which I get the Jake Hansen sign then because we don't really have another backup, true backup center. So I get that signing. 
um, free safety and strong safety was a concern for death purposes with Vernon Scott. Now, if you look up Vernon Scott's draft profile, you can't see anything on him. He's, there's like nothing out there on him. So they must have just, he must have just passed the eye test on for like a scout. Sometimes he could be a diamond in the rough sign. Let's hope that's the case. We do lack safety death. That like, it, it's just, that's just a fact. And then we took Jonathan Garvin in the seventh, which is another death piece. And with just hope that, by the time you're drafting in the seventh round, you're just hoping – you're just drafting guys who have got athletic abilities and tested off the chart, might not know how to play football that well, but you hope that they can learn how, how to play football because they got the physical tools. So uh, I feel like this draft was mostly just like a – like a just in case we can't – like like don't go thinking that like it's almost going to be – I feel like they're going to hedge their bets a little bit at the negotiating table be like – like be like – Hey, dude, we got your backup already waiting for you. If you don't want to take a hometown discount for us to, to like come back and play, like, like, like we got, you know, AJ or Aaron Jones. Like, don't think we need you, man. We got, we got AJ Dillon waiting to take your job next year if you want to charge us too much. Or same for like Jake Hansen. Like Corey Lindsay, you're not gonna outprice us because you've been consistent. We 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 groom Jake Hansen. He he learned from you last year. He'll take your job and do just as good if not better. Like that's what they're like. I feel like that's their negotiating tactic. Tactic is to like just have a contingency plan. This was a next year draft, so more yeah. And I uh, I I agree with you there. It, it seems like a combination of uh, getting pieces for Lafleur to fully implement his system, and also contingency plans for next year. Um, and you know, there's uh, there's pros and cons to that. You know, long term it may work out, uh, but at the same time, you know, you you got you're fortunate enough to get two Hall of Fame quarterbacks in a row. You don't know how many more years you have left. Um, you know, to, you tell me when you're trying to get past the San Francisco 49ers, who've been picking in the top five, top ten for years, uh, is it? Is it wiser and easier to rely on several draft halls of, you know, snatching diamonds in the rough and and getting the right players for the system and building the team up over multiple years and so that you're not relying on one player so much? Or is it better to take the guy who you know is a transcendent talent, who's taken you to the promised land before, who and who's like he's he's the leader on question the leader of that team is it better to say hey this guy gets us in the dance every year maybe just maybe he gets hot if we give him the right pieces uh because i mean the san francisco niners at 49ers i don't think you're going to compete with them uh man to man on a talent level they've just they've got too many good high draft picks you need an x factor and uh you know, I think if I'm betting on X factors, Aaron Rodgers is a pretty damn good one. Uh, but you know, that's neither here nor there. We we did not take that approach. We we've taken an approach to emulate the 49ers. Um, it seems like a more forward-thinking, long-term approach. Uh, will Aaron Rodgers uh, see the the fruits of that? You know, what will play action? revitalize his career in, in a, a new kind of Aaron Rodgers that we've never seen before. I mean, I, if the Tennessee Titans offense can make Ryan Tannehill look that good, I, I am excited to see Aaron Rodgers buy in a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, if this is a power struggle where your transcendent player is not willing to buy in, I, I got to ask – if we knew that going in, and we had to, he ran McCarthy out of time. If we knew that, why did they make the decision they made to change everything rather than push your chips in on, on the, the girl that took you to the dance? I don't think that they're doing this with much of Rodgers in mind, to be honest with you. I think this is like – they're they're playing for years after Rogers type thing like like Rogers as great as he is like he can win you a Super Bowl but they also want to make sure that they can be successful after the Rogers years are over and and all of a sudden that like they're they're not going to be 
getting fired as after a year or two of being in, in the in the doldrums post Rogers. Um, this thought did just come to me, by the way, just now in our talking is because you keep I know you keep mentioning chasing the 49ers and Gutekunst and LaFleur have both been asked that in the past. And they have said that we're not chasing a single team. We're trying to get our own team better. And if you look at these picks and they all look like death picks. Now let's play, let's play devil's advocate here. What if an Aaron Jones gets hurt in the year? Well, you, now you've got A.J. Dillon who can potentially just replace the, almost the same. Now, I know they're different players and different skill sets, but potentially not drop off. And you still go 13-3. Like, we don't go 13-3 and three without Aaron Jones next year. Or Blake Martinez, tackling machine. Maybe a Kamal Martin comes in and, like, rookie year can be a tackling machine as well. Uh, God forbid, like, a Corey Lindsley goes down or another offensive lineman goes down. And all of a sudden, Rodgers is running for his life. We got lots of depth at the offensive line now. So injuries happen every year, and we were somehow very successful with injuries last year. So – Instead of chasing the 49ers, the 49ers could get ravaged with injuries next year, and they don't even make the playoffs next year, maybe because they're so ravaged with injuries, because they didn't do a good enough job of replacing their death at the at their most important positions, and they don't make the play and they can't recover. We this draft could potentially be where we drafted death at positions that we've identified as our important positions where we can sustain injuries and still be successful. Whereas other teams like the 49ers, now they got some good depth too, but we might never even, we might not play the 49ers in the playoffs next year if we make it, if they get ravaged with injuries. Why are we going to worry about getting past the 49ers if they get ravaged by injuries and we don't got to play them in the playoffs? Like I think the reason you worry about the 49ers, I can understand not chasing one team. Uh, you know, someone like the Saints, of, of course, they're a contender every year. I wouldn't build my team to beat them, though, because Drew Brees is going to be gone in a year or two. Mm-hmm. 49ers are a different scenario. They are built for the long haul. Maybe we don't see them in the playoffs next year. Maybe we do. Uh, but I guarantee you, you know, they, they're they going to be our 90s Dallas Cowboys. We are going to have to get past them or hope somebody else bounces them if we want to win the big one in the next few years, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they've, they've got their their contracts under control. They're actively adding talent, improving. Um, You know, I think the 49ers are going to be an obstacle for a while. I Uh, I agree. So that I, I can certainly see an argument for building for them. Uh, I do think you need to always build to your division first. Um, which, uh, you know, we, we do play outdoor cold weather games, you know, maybe running, uh, maybe that is a wise direction to move in. Um, you know, thankfully our division rivals, um, you know, they, they have a lot of talent on their rosters, but none of them have uh, really sniffed a truly elite quarterback in a long, long time. Uh, you know, Matt Stafford is probably the best of them, but the team around them is garbage. Uh, Kirk Cousins, he puts up stats, but, uh, you know, put the lights on and he, he's a house of cards. Yep. Uh, Mitch Trubisky, best pick that's happened for the Packers <laughs> in years. Um, it kills I, you knowing that Mitch, like, they could have Pat Mahomes and Sean Watson and they went Mitch Trubisky. Thank God. Thank God yeah. we got the Bears in our division. Thank God the Bears suck. <laughs> Holy God. Could you imagine Pat Mahomes on, on this Bears team with that defense? Oh, my God. Dark Good ages. night. Yeah. It'd be the dark ages. It'd be the dark ages. Yeah. Now, quickly, that did. That's. I think a lot of Packer fans have been having such a hard time with this Jordan Love pick, is because for the last couple of years I've been like trying to mentally prepare myself for the upcoming dark ages. Like, like there's no way no team has ever still been successful after two Hall of Fame quarterbacks have like left. Think about the 49ers. They went with uh, Jeff Garcia, and they were still okay, but not that great after Steve Young, Joe Montana. Like, so I've been mentally preparing myself for, for the dark ages for Packer fans, like 70s, 80s Packers again for a while. Taking Jordan Love in the, in the first round gives me hope, and it could be false hope, that maybe, 
maybe we could still be just as prolific as we were since 1992. And that, that could break my heart. That could be a heartbreaker if Jordan Love doesn't pan out and you take it like, now I have hope. Now I have hope that we can be good. We can have elite quarterback play for 45 years. It's giving me hope. Wouldn't now. it be nice? <laughs> it would be nice. And that's what I'm hoping for. Now, whether it happens, I don't know. There's like Jordan Love's got to make some progress between now and then. But um, what I think real quickly before like we, we end the thing, uh, we'll look ahead to – our re-signings real quick. I see that we both ranked our big five re-signings. We have some similarities and some differences. Uh, you got enough time to kind of just go through this real quick with me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I I figure next time uh, I would like to dive into defense because I've got a, a lot to say about Patton. And mm-hmm. uh, and I think there's I think there's some good discussion out there. Um, I would but, yeah, talk I, I would, about Patton. Yeah, I, I would love to go over, uh, you know, our both the uh, the free agents who signed this year real quickly, uh, because I, I do think I think there's a bit more to that than uh, just filling out the roster. Uh, and of course, our upcoming free agents for next year is uh, obviously a big part of uh, the planning for for our free agent signings this year and the draft this year. Um, so, I mean, why don't you dive in? Uh, what's what are your thoughts on this? All right. So here's – so clearly the big five of our free agents is universal. Everyone should probably have the same big five we've got. And in no specific order yet, we're get, we got we got two offensive linemen and Corey Lindsley and David Bakhtiari who are up. Uh, we have a really young, t- good defensive lineman, Kane Clark, who's up after this year. And then we have Kevin King who led our secondary – Last year in picks, he's been on and off with injuries. And then, of course, our prolific running back with Aaron Jones, as well as Jamal Williams as well. But I think everyone can agree that Aaron Jones has been the more prolific of the two. Um, I have it. I think our biggest priority free agent should be David Bakhtiari. We should resign him um, at all costs because of how important it is at the left tackle position. And he's been elite. Now, I know that – now, I struggle between Bakhtiari and Kenny Clark at the number one spot because I know that Bakhtiari is likely in his prime right now, and by re-signing him, you're likely going to get some some declining production towards the end of his contract. Whereas, so with someone like Kenny Clark, you would hope that he's on the up and up throughout his entire contract that when you re-sign him, but I just think that left tackle is such a important position, especially for what you're trying to do and protecting your franchise, that it's got to be your biggest priority besides quarterback. And even if that means sacrificing a year or two of decreased production, and I mean, this guy's been all pro for multiple years. Uh, he's been snuffed for Pro Bowls. He's been snuffed for the all pro team. But this guy's this guy's best of the bunch. I can't think of a better left tackle in the league right now than David Bakhtiari. Uh, I mean, Tyrone Smith was up there for me with the Cowboys, but he's clearly on on, on, on on the decline. I can't think of a better left tackle in the game than David Bakhtiari. you got to re-sign him at all costs. And Yeah, he- yeah. Hand, hands down, I agree. Uh, Bakhtiari is priority number one. Um, I mean, I, I do think his play – took a little bit of a hit last year, um, but I suspect there might have been uh, injury involved in that that maybe mm-hmm. we, we didn't know about uh, because prior prior to this past year, uh, it, like you said, the guy's been an all-pro year in, year out. Uh, I I can't think of another left tackle I'd taken the lead above him. Um, yeah, so I, I don't care that it's his third contract. Uh, you know, he's still – Tackles tend to play into their mid thirties at, at an elite level. So if you got a guy, you lock him up. It's not like we have anyone even sniffing a starting no. spot uh, besides even, him. So. Even if you don't get like any season better than his previous season, like even if it's all decreased production at this point, it's probably better than any other left tackle options you're going to have out there for the next few seasons to go. So I, I see that. I see we're both. Unanimous on our number two pick, though, which is Kenny Clark. I mean, 
I kind of mentioned earlier, he's an ascending talent at clearly a position of weakness for us. Best he, defensive player we had. Yeah, he is. He is like he's like Warren Sapp in the making. And it took him a couple of years to get acclimated because we drafted when he was 20 years old. We knew he was going to be a project, but he's coming up at the end of his end of his contract now, and he's still like 23, 24, 23, 24 years old. He's still a really young player, and he's going to keep getting better. Like. He now, could, I, I he do think be. the fact that he is so young and ascending, getting better and growing every year, uh, I think Kenny Clark is going to break the bank. You know, I, I think it's going to be a signing. Yeah. We're, we're going to have to, uh, you know, just bear and grin it. Uh, I, I don't think we have anywhere, Mm-mm. anything close to a contingency plan Mm-mm. for him to leave. So Mm-mm. we, we got to resign yeah. him, uh, but it's, it's going to be an expensive contract uh, that it, it's probably going to limit us in other places. It will. Uh, we, we, we do need to realize that when we re-sign Ken Clark and Bakhtiari to these contracts that we are going to have to deal with potentially weaknesses in other areas because we're going to be cap-trapped, as well as Rogers' contract, which only gets bigger um, as well. Like, I hope that this doesn't come – like, now after – if we re-sign Bakhtiari – Bacteria and Clark, along with the outside linebackers that we signed, along with Aaron Rodgers' contract. The next guy after that, I, I'm going to be worried about is uh, Devontae Adams and Jair Alexander. I want to make sure that, you know, we're going to have enough money to resign them too. I'm going to be heartbroken if we got to let Devontae Adams go because we, you know, couldn't do that. So I don't know. Um, in it's, fact, it's going to be tough. The, that's that's what they make the big bucks for. They uh, those two has got to make that work. Those two are so important that I would be okay. Me personally, I would be okay if we can resign both of them to like three, four year contracts. I would be okay with letting these next three players go if if it meant that we got both of these players. As tough it as it is, because they're good players. Um. These, these these two positions are just so important that I, I think that we just can't not resign them. But uh, we do got different thirds. Uh, the third player I, I would prefer to resign is Corey Lindsley. Uh, and you got Aaron Jones, uh, which, yes. is very, which is a very popular pick. Well, so I, uh, you know, in general, I think you look across the league um, and the Rams are just the most recent example of typically paying a running back doesn't work out um you know even though you know the Rams offense ran through Todd Gurley in much the same way that our offense runs through Aaron Jones now um and it didn't work out for them to pay him Aaron Jones does have an injury history you know last year was the first year he was really healthy the whole year um so it's it's a really risky signing uh you know if, if he wants top running back in the league money I don't think it's worth it but if the guy's willing to take a hometown discount, um, you know, I think I think what Matt LaFleur wants to do with this offense, uh, I don't think one running back is enough. And I think Aaron Jones is multiple in a way that, uh, you know, very few running backs are. You know, I, I think he, we're going to see him catch more balls next year. Uh, you know, he's not exactly going to be uh, McCaffrey with the Panthers. Uh, but he's – He's a, essentially you're getting a, a number one running back and a number two or three receiver all in one package. Uh, if we can reduce his workload w- with the addition of AJ Dillon, uh, you know maybe that helps his health, uh, especially with the 17 game season now. Um, it's uh, you know running back depth is going to be more important. Those guys get banged up. It will be. Uh, so you know I I think he means so much to this offense that. Uh, I, I'm willing to take the risk on on uh, the the mileage and the injury history, and uh, and hope that a second contract works out. He is still young. I think if we did resign to a three four year contract, he would still be either 29 or 30 by the time his contract's up. So he'd still be you know right at that 30 year threshold. Um, if you wanted, if if Jones wanted top five running back in the league money, do you resign him? Top five. With the fact that we no, we we took no other we took no wide receivers and the one running back we did take, he's a he's a two hundred fifty pound bruiser. 
a very different style. Um, you know, I, I don't think he's going to be, you know, some people have compared him to like Derrick Henry. Uh, Derrick Henry has just such a unique blend of speed and power for a guy his size. I, I don't think that's going to be A.J. Dillon. I think it's going to be more of a traditional bruiser. Um, so I think losing Jones, it really, I think it could cripple the offense. Right? So, you know, maybe if he needs top five money, we might have to. So let me throw this out here. Like, let's think long term. So say Aaron Jones wants like top five money and you deem him as, you know, a need to pay him for that. If paying Aaron Jones that money comes at the cost of having to let Devontae Adams go because we paid Aaron Jones that money, do you still do that deal? If under – now, you got to consider the Fleur system, which is running backs are more important than receivers in the Fleur system. But it's, it's nice to have a guy like Devontae. You, you know, still need – I don't care what system you're on, you still need a number one receiver. Uh, if the choice were Devontae or Jones, I, we'd have to let Devontae go. And, uh, you know, the one good thing about uh, – You would rather back, have – Aaron Jones or, over the sorry, 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 sorry. I, I misspoke. I misspoke. Uh, it, we would have to let Jones go um, okay. if that were the case because, uh, you know, the one good thing about letting a running back go is you can find a – like if you're willing to spend a high draft pick, you can find a quality player who's going to contribute year one, give you a cheap, you know, four or five years. Uh, it can be done. I mean, you're, you're rolling the dice – hoping that the guy is as good as Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones led the league in touchdowns last year mm -hmm. um, and really is just getting his feet wet in his offense. Uh, but, yeah, if, if I had to choose between uh, Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones, uh, Jones has got to go. I would, I, would, I would agree with that. Exact, specifically because if, that's, if it comes down to that, now I'm trying to think ahead with the cap situation going forward if something like that come, were in the play, I would rather have Devontae. And then I would also want to, like, try to re-sign maybe Jamal Williams for, like, a cheaper deal and then pair him with A.J. Dillon, and then that's my running back duo along with Devontae because I feel like Devontae, A.J. Dillon, and Jamal Williams would probably be a more prolific, balanced, more balanced offense than having to do, you know, just a straight running back heavy with Jones, Dillon, and – at that point, you probably let, let Williams go, but then you have a big hole trying to find, like, good luck trying to fill that. Devontae, at the same time, I think we're both kind of, like, on the same agreement that, like, Devontae's probably deserves a third contract. I'm not sure. I think he's got got two year, two or three years left on his deal. He's kind of – I think after this five, he's, he's the year after that. I think he's coming up really soon, so yeah. – like you got and honestly, he, he's a player who he has continued to improve year in and yeah. year out. Uh, you know, he and I don't think he gets nearly enough credit for being an elite number one wide receiver. Uh, yeah, I think, I, he's I think twenty he's, or twenty nine right now. Like when you I, offer him, he's going to be like 30, around thirty when his contract's right. up. I think thirty thirty one. I do think he's probably deserves a contract into like maybe his mid fifties, whether or not he his, his mid fifties, thirties, <laughs> mid thirties. I'm not sure. Um, well, here, t tell me this, because so your number three was Corey Lindsley, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think I think this ties in well to uh, you know I'm I'm sort of valuing Aaron Jones, the player, the individual uh, as as a an elite level talent. Uh, where obviously a, a different approach you can take there is an elite level line can uh, create um, high quality uh, running game. Uh, That's my thinking. Now, I traditionally I I'm on board with this. Uh, you know, I, th I think the Cowboys were a great example. They they mm -hmm. built an elite offensive line. Uh, they also happen to have an elite running back, so you know that that worked out well for them. Uh, my only question is: Is Corey Lindsley elite? I don't think he can say that. I I think maybe they they want to see how uh, the the sixth rounder this year with uh, J Jake Henson. Um, I, I think they want to see how he develops this year. And if, if they feel comfortable, um, I mean, a lot of fifth, sixth, seventh round centers uh, go on to become successful yeah. starting centers. Yeah. Um, I think Corey Lindsay's top 10. I think an argument could be made for top five. 
I'm I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not trying to get into that debate at the moment without having to do more research into everything. I do know he's extremely consistent, and I do know he's extremely durable. Uh, you know what you're getting in Lindsley, and it's and you and you're getting something good in in Lindsley. Are you getting like just straight elite every game? Yeah, maybe not. But are you? Is he a liability? Never. He's never been a, a liability on the offensive line, and he's con, and he's durable. Yeah, he's he's had some bad games here and there, but everyone does. He hardly ever gets hurt, and on a position like that, that's that's something to be said. And he's still he's still young, and uh, yeah, is there one of the most important positions on the line? I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on your philosophy, I guess. But the way the way I do see it is. I would rather have a dominant offensive line and then just have some, you know, okay, average running backs looking like superstars because of the offensive line. And I, I like Aaron, to me, Aaron Jones is nothing if you have a crappy offensive line behind you. And I do think Lindsley does make the line better. Um, so I do prioritize the big guys over the skill players a little bit more. And I guess, I mean, you pay him top five center money. Oh, I would, I would really have to add, I would really have to do some research into the future positions. I am not willing to pay him money high enough that prevents me from having to re-sign any future players in the next two to three years, like a Devontae Adams or Jerry Alexander, or um, even like Zedarius Smith if his contract's up around the time. I'm not willing to sacrifice players like that to keep something like that. But if I can have him for a decent amount and it doesn't doesn't capture me, I would I, like if if I had to choose between the two without it affecting any future players, and I can re-sign the same players in the future between Lindsley and Jones, and I just have to pick one or the other. I'm just personally going with Lindsley over Jones, especially after this draft and and what we did. So, well, so I I can certainly. Uh... I hear your argument there. I, I think there's a valid point. Um, I think the actions that the Packers took with this recent draft, I, I think they spell an exit for Lindsley next year. Yeah. I mean, we took three offensive linemen who, frankly, you could argue that all of them are interior guys, mm -hmm. uh, at least two of them. Yep. And, um, yeah, I, I think I think Goo is going to look at it. Like, between the three new guys and uh, you got Jenkins who – played center in college and now he's uh i mean i oh, i don't want to say all pro but uh he, he is a hell of a player at left guard i well, think, you think uh, about him too so I, I think if you if you had to you could slide him to center in a pinch um i i think they're going to find a way to reinforce the interior of the line without lindsley precisely so they can sign uh you know guys in the future yeah. whether whether it's this upcoming year or the yeah. year after um but uh, I mean, I I know you've mentioned uh, Alexander a couple times, um, and uh, you know, obviously, clearly our best secondary player. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the guy who's coming up this year, um, bit of an enigma, Kevin oh. King. Holy cow! Yeah, and I see we both have him as number four on list. We are in agreement that he is uh, number four. Um, man, is Kevin King just an enigma? Is a perfect term. He. He he has the talent to he he's got the talent man he's got the talent uh he's had a bad 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 run of it and I'm almost I almost wanted to put him three just because of the fact that God I cannot go through another another secondary player leaving us and just going on to to be a prolific talent like I see I see Kevin King as almost like a Casey Hayward you know like that was what that that's what led to Casey Hayward not being resigned is because he he had the talent, but he was so hurt that we just felt like he he could never be healthy enough to like fulfill his like contract. So we let him go, and lo and behold, like he, he well one they did move him to outside outside corner in in uh, L A slash San Diego, and we didn't think that we could he could play on the outside and you know shut down corner on the outside too, but and he was healthy. Um, I'm afraid of Kevin King being something similar. He's got the talent. He's he's got that bum shoulder that's been bothering him for years. But he led us in, in picks last year, 
and we've been so just god unlucky with with cornerback play. I would I would like us to see Kevin. I would like to, if he can have another full healthy year and not get hurt and miss like a good chunk of the time. I would love to see us resign Kevin King, yeah. just so, so just so that we can finally have some some solidarity and some consistency at that position going forward. Yeah. Um, and he's, uh, he's got the skills. He's got the height. He's got the measurables. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he we drafted him to be our Richard Sherman pretty much, mm-hmm. and and he's got every tool in the toolbox to to be that if mm-hmm. he can just get enough consistent time on the field to to gain the experience. And mm-hmm. and you know he uh, he he was a little inconsistent this past year, um, but I I really do think if he has another you know fully healthy season, uh, I think we're looking at two legitimate number one corners mm-hmm. on our roster and you know that that kind of luxury uh that just transforms what you can do on oh defense. it does absolutely um so i mean if and and it's uh, this is the thing with kevin king it's always if you know if he stays healthy um i think he could be a vital part of this team mm-hmm. does he stay healthy uh history says probably not says last year was uh, an exception. Um, it, if he gets hurt again this year, I don't think we resign him. So here's the kicker with Kevin King. And this is, if I was Goot, this is what I want to do. But sadly, I don't think this is how it's going to work um, in, in, in the real world is given his injury history, I would want to offer him a contract that is lucrative but is also very contingent on his ability to stay on the field. So the more he stays on the field, the more games he plays, the more money he will make. And he could get paid like a, like a very elite corner if he can stay on the field. The thing is, I feel like at a, at a position in the NFL that's so needy, there's going to be a team out there that's willing to offer him yeah. guaranteed yep. money that – isn't contingent upon him staying on the field and gladly take that over something that's very incentive based. So that is, that is going to be, that's a decision that if I was the GM of the Packers, I do not want to be having to make is that's going to be a very tough decision because that could, that's a, that's a, that's a decision that could really make or break a football team that could, that's a decision that can either get you over the top or you could you could suffer and and not be able to fill other holes with that money so yeah i mean the honestly the way i see that situation playing out is uh if kevin king stays healthy in 2020 and balls out i think he prices himself out of green bay because you, you're essentially deciding do you want king or alexander uh, i think alexander has shown more to be worth the contract um or the other option is if King gets hurt again, uh, yeah, we probably could uh, re-sign him with a hometown mm-hmm. discount. Uh, but I, I think you're talking four out of five years injured. Uh, yep. I, I don't think they do it at that point. Uh, so, you know, honestly, that's uh, probably a great segue for for our next episode is sort of getting into the defense for 2020 Absolutely. and beyond. Um because, I do want to talk about Josh yeah. Jackson a little bit and like where he's at. Yeah. So we'll save that for, for our next episode. We'll, we'll do like a position by position breakdown of defense. And we'll also talk about uh, Patton and his philosophy and his, his method methodology. He's, he's done some good things. He's done some poor things um, as well. Um, I will leave us with the, with our number fives. I did obviously, cause we had our threes flipped, but our fours the same. So, we just come back around full circle. Our, my number five was Aaron Jones, and your number five was Lindsley. Um, again, that was just a differing of opinions, but for the most part, we do seem to have the same thinking in terms of our upcoming free agent class. Um, do you uh, – go ahead. So I was just going to say uh, that there is one more thing I, I'd like to just briefly touch on. Um, you know, before we end for the night Absolutely. and, uh, and, you know, we, we don't have to, to dive deep into it because it's, it's kind of a loaded topic. We could probably spend another 40 minutes talking about this. We'll but, leave the fans with something to come back <laughs> to, you know, we'll, a little teaser. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so when I, 
when I think about the free agency signings for this year, um, and then the draft, I think there is a legitimate argument to be made that the organization went into this year with a very deliberate purpose of uh, not only sending a message to Aaron Rodgers, as some people have said, uh, and once again, I, I don't think the Jordan Love pick was sending a message. I, I think that was they saw an opportunity that they had to take because uh, is Patrick Queen really going to be that much better? Uh, but but when you look at everything else, uh, cum, uh, you know, cumulatively, you uh, you let Aaron Rodgers, longtime right tackle, warrior protector Brian Bulaga, you I, let him you let him go, and you sign a Detroit Lions cast off who has his own injury history, who's also over thirty, so you can save what four million something like that. Um, and, and from what I have researched, I, I, it is my understanding that Wagner is a, a better run blocker, um, mm -hmm. and, and Belaga's strength has always been pass blocking. Uh, not that he was bad at run blocking, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do think maybe that is part of the deliberate shift to, uh, hey, Rogers, if you want to hang on to the ball and play Sandlot, you're not going to have the same – a uh, telepathic connection with the offensive lineman. We're, we're getting a guy who wants to go attack defensive linemen. Uh, you know, I, th I think that is a big thing here. I think Devin Funches, um, we didn't sign him for his receiving prowess. We signed him because he is a big, physical, strong receiver who's going to be an excellent blocker, uh, probably play some in, at the uh, play factor in the red zone. Um Defensive signings, I'll you know we'll save that for next time. Uh, but you know, looking at those two signings, and then we take a big power back and an H back and three interior offensive linemen. Um, I, I think he can argue that uh, Aaron Rodgers wants to play Aaron Rodgers ball. He is the hail mary king. I mean, who when, when you've done the things he's done why wouldn't you believe you can always win the game? Uh, and I think they're, they're trying to force him into a more contained game. Uh, if only for, you know, just by virtue of him needing to protect himself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that might be his only option with, with the personnel that they're surrounding him with. Now, I don't think Sandlot ball is going to be that much of an option going forward. I agree. Um, I think this is my opinion, but I think the signs that we did, I, I don't know. I don't think that they were done as much as trying to send a message to Rogers as they were to try to just, uh, fit LaFleur's what he wants to do on offense. Um, I think, I think this offense is going to become what LaFleur wants it to be, whether Rodgers is on board with it or not. Like Rodgers, Rodgers either has to adapt his game or he's going to get, you know, cast aside type thing. And I think Rodgers can flourish in the system if he embraces it and makes adjustments to it. And Rodgers has come out and said that he is, he likes things about this offense and he's a consummate pro. Um, I, I, I do think the biggest thing for Rodgers is he just needs to save himself from himself, really. And I do think this offense that Lafleur can can give him will do that. Rodgers just does need to like kind of swallow his own pride at times and just like adapt his game a little bit and get rid of like like we're trying to eliminate that sandlock ball ball a little bit. Like we're trying to do things that that allows Rodgers to be prolific without the ball in his hands, open up the run game. And then all of a sudden the play action game becomes crazy. And then all of a sudden you do get like a wide, like if MVS is having a hard time getting, getting wide open because he can't separate from receivers, what better way to hit him for a fucking 60, 70 yard bomb than to have a dominant run game and stack the box. The next thing you know, that cornerback's thinking it's going to be a run. It's a play action and MVS is wide open for like a 60 yard bomb. 
Now, if he can't catch a wide open six yard bomb, yeah, it's time to move on from MBS. But I think that's like yeah, another guy we do. didn't talk about is uh, Equimania St. Brown. Uh, I, you know, I won't spend a lot of time, but uh, I, I think he is going to play a, a bigger role this season. A lot of people aren't talking about him. He was IR last year, uh, but he's just as fast as MBS, you know, uh-huh. you know maybe, maybe a tenth of a second okay. slower. Yep. Uh, six five, um, better route runner. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he developed a little bit slower, didn't have quite the rookie success, but he came mm-hmm. on toward the end of his year. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping between one of those two, uh, I hope someone emerges as, as a deep threat. And, and I agree, I think play action will really help both of them. Yeah, I think, I think if you look back and people kind of brush it off and then think much of it at the time, but I think it's a bigger, bigger, bigger deal than what it is, is when we put EQ – on IR for a high ankle sprain in preseason. I think that was a, a telltale sign of how much we actually believe in EQ. Um, because all too well, if you look at Devonte Adams second year in the NFL, he had a high ankle sprain and we did not put him on the IR and he struggled with that throughout the whole year. And fans wanted his head because he, you know, all of a sudden he was a bust. He didn't pan out and look at him. Now he was hindered all year long with that high ankle sprain and he, never was fully healthy i think we put him on ir in preseason with a high ankle sprain to save him from himself and him to go through a whole whole year of just trying to battle through an injury you know what kid you're young you got talent we believe in you uh we also feel like we got some pieces around you where we can still be successful take this year off get healthy hit the playbook hard hit the weight room when you can come back next year and just be a better version of yourself, uh, you'll have a clean slate. It's your third year. I I see big things for EQ, and I think the fact that we put him on IR instead of trying to like just let him bail through the injury and help us last year and like kind of mortgage current success for future su- success. I think that's a telltale sign of how much we actually believe in MBS. And I think that we can, I think he could be better. He could be a number two receiver for us. We haven't even mentioned Alan, Alan Lazard. Lazard we'll save, yeah. yeah. We'll save that for, 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 uh, for a future one as well. We'll do, we'll, we should probably do a position, but like a depth chart breakdown where we each do our, uh, like a breakdown of different positions. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think that I, I'm, I'm glass half full on the receivers. I don't think we're ever going to, you know, have the best receivers in the league. But if you look around at, like, the rest of the NFL with the receivers, like, how many teams in the NFL actually have, like, you know, two number one receivers on their team? Like, not not really too many. I, I know the Cowboys are trying to do that, but that's the McCarthy system. And that's what – Green Bay fans are. Yeah. I do got to say that Cowboys offense is going to be fun to watch. Man. It's going to be. It's going to be crazy. They, they're going to have Amari Cooper. They're going to have Ceedee Lamb and Michael like, Gallup. Yeah, Michael Gallup. I mean, that's that's going to be tough to stop. But at the same, let's not forget they got Zeke Elliott. They're going to be a fun offense to watch. And you know what? The Cowboys could become the 49ers of last year, they could make a run. You know what? You never know. That's a, that could be a scary offense. So you never know. Um, uh, well, will, be, uh, be, before, before we, uh, part for the night, I, uh, I want to leave you with my hot take for the week here. Um, if we had just re-signed Brian Bulaga, I think there would be way less, uh, buzz about uh, the disrespect to Aaron Rodgers about yeah. playing for the future instead of now. I, I think, uh, I don't know, man. I, th- I think trying to save that four mil a year, that's, we, is it worth the PR hit? <laughs> I know, I know me and you personally have, have gone back and forth on this right tackle spot for the last couple months here. Um, you are pro Brian Balaga and I certainly appreciate all that he's done for green Bay. Um, I do not think that he will live up to his contract, no matter, even if it's swallowable for us. Um, I don't think Rick Wagner is the future for us either. I think he's a quick stopgap. Um, I know Blaga would have been, I mean, I know the contracts are similar, uh, about $4 million more per year for Blaga. 
Um, again, I, I'm just trusting the process, and I think there's a reason why they didn't. Um, as you said, Wagner's a, more on paper. He's a better run blocker, um, and I do think that we're just switching to a run run team. We're going to become a run team. We're, 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 we are going to become the Tennessee Titans with a much better quarterback, which could be pretty nasty if it works out. Like, Imagine the Titans, who made it to the AFC Championship game. However, replace Ryan Tannehill with Aaron Rodgers and replace Corey Davis with Devontae Adams. Mm, that could be pretty yeah. good, man. Um, the last question I will ask you is just a pretty quick yes or no, um, but it's a good stopping point. In your opinion, did we get better as a football team this offseason? Yes, I, I I think we lost some important depth, uh, Brian Budwaga. Uh But year two in the system, getting players to fit the system, um, younger players growing. Uh, you know, I I think we're going to be a better team. I better does not necessarily mean better record. I don't know if we I go agree. thirteen three. I agree. Year, I agree. But I, I think, think we're we we're gonna be a more battle tested team. Uh you know, we're we're we've LaFour showed last year that he can get this team to win mm. any kind of game. They can mm. they can win ugly, they they can win in multiple ways, uh they can blow people out. Uh and I think this year the lessons of last year uh will serve them well. Uh I'll say it right now, I think we're a playoff team. I still think we're the I favorite agree. for the division. Mm-hmm. Um I still think that Aaron Rodgers is our ticket to a Super Bowl if, if he gets hot because I don't think we have the talent yet to get past teams like the Niners uh, unless someone like Aaron Rodgers just goes out of their mind. I I think we could do it. I still think the championship window is wide open for us. Um, I don't – I see us being at the top of our division. I also think that we got better as a football team this season. I think you're going to see a more consistent – football team next year whether or not that means I don't necessarily as you said I don't think we might not go 13 and 3 again um however I can totally see us going like 10 and 6 next year or 11 and 5 um again being a playoff team but I think that the games that we do win you're gonna have less of those like oh my god like like we're about to lose it but then you know like we just barely won at the last moment I think you're gonna see more consistency you're gonna see uh we're, we're, we're going to, when we win games, they're going to be in a little bit more of a dominant fashion in, uh, in the coming years. And when we lose, they're going to be more like, we're going to be in the ball game, you know, more. I don't think you're going to see too many, you know, San Francisco blowouts uh, next year. And I, and t- off the top of my head, that was like the only real blowouts I think we had last year is the San Francisco games. Mm, Chargers game wasn't great. Yeah, the Chargers but, game was uh, not great. Uh, a little, got, we got to get better about traveling to the West Coast. Some, yeah. Something's going on there. Yeah. Um, we, uh, I, I think we'll be more consistent. I do think we got better as a, as a football team. And I think most of it's just the fact that we're going into year two of a new system. And uh, for the majority, like, you know, 80% of the players are, have already experienced it and they know what to expect and what to do going forward in, in the year two. And they know what the playbook is. Um, so with that being said, Cody Trell, I want to thank you for being here on the first ever Context Gaming Podcast. Uh, we will certainly do this again soon. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, we will look forward to tackling the defensive side of the football ne- on our next podcast, as well as specifically the Mike Patton system. We'll do a breakdown of position by position position by position analysis of our team. We'll each do a projected 53 man roster. What we think the, at the moment, what the 53 man roster will look like. And we'll also do maybe a little bit of a, of a wish list for the free agency. Like who we both would <laughs> love to see on the team. I know you've got some ideas about that, Mr. P, but we'll, we'll save oh, it for the next yeah. episode. Oh, leave some, leave the fans with a, something to look forward to. You certainly don't want to miss the next show. We will do this again soon. I want to thank all you guys for supporting Context Gaming. Uh, we certainly appreciate it to all my Patreon fans. You can check us out. Um, just look Context Gaming on Patreon. As always, check out our website at www.contextgaming.com. 
Uh, smash that like button on Facebook. Subscribe to us. Uh, we were also, I will also be more prolific about updating our, our Twitter handle as well. And uh, as always, we'll get back to some more gaming stuff. Um, however, with that being said, go pack go. Thank you, Cody Cottrell. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you.